Today, Katy Perry is one of the most colorful entertainers in the world. Her quirky cartoon image defines her as one of music's most talked about artists. I can't do it or my boobs will fall out and that would be like way yeah, more than this interview that. needs. <laughs> Teenage Dream went platinum five times. And just a couple of years ago, Katy Perry had been sitting in her car wondering how she was going to pay for it. It's incredible. While her short marriage to controversial comic actor Russell Brand made headlines everywhere, her bubbly personality has endeared her to some of music's harshest critics. When I first heard California Girls, I thought it was brilliant because I couldn't tell initially what era it was from. I just thought it was like really smart. Everything about it was smart, from the guests to the way it was built musically to the video. I thought it was just genius musically. Welcome to the outrageous world of Katy Perry. Katy Perry is a slice of pure Americana. With her kooky style and witty lyrics, she's a true pop star for the millennium. But behind all the Disney-like facade, Katie's unique talent has helped her emerge as an international music star and a huge commercial success. But Katie's music is definitely pop. It's pure pop. Some people would say it's bubblegum pop. However, she's got some incredible songwriting talent and her vocals are actually very, very strong. I think her music has uh, resonated with an audience because people can relate to it. You know, she sings about everything from falling in love to uh, feeling out of sorts to can I take this to the next level, relationships, friendships, sex, you know, it's like everything that you can, that comes at you in life ends up in her music. Katie's music has been so successful because she is unique. Now you could say that your Beyonce's, Rihanna's are all unique. Are they? They kind of have that sexy image, so sexy. Katie's removed herself from these guys by saying, I'm gonna be a wee bit more girly, fun, flirtatious, cartoon-like. And it astonishes me when I go to barbecues with friends and the five-year-olds are dancing to Katy Perry songs. They want to be her. It's not Rihanna they want to be, it's Katy Perry. And their mum, they like, they like Katy Perry too. She ticks all boxes. Now that's the key to her success because she's got every age group listening, they like her, she's not a threat. Lady Gaga's a bit of a threat because she can be a bit menacing, a bit naughty. She goes further than naughty. Katy Perry's flirtatious and cheeky and naughty. She's not downright dangerous. I dressed as Katy Perry for Halloween right when she came out and I went to um, a party and none of the adults there knew who I was. But I was in charge for a while of manning the door and every single little girl that came to that door when I was giving him candy went, oh, you look just like Katy Perry. And that's when I knew this Katy Perry chick, she's gonna be big because the little girls already know her look and they already love her and they're already excited to see a Halloween costume of her. It's like, if you get the little girls, you get the record sales. Little girls rule the pop world. She's had now had five number one singles in a row. That's pretty much unprecedented. She's only the second artist to ever do that. And the only other artist was Michael Jackson on Bad. I think her style constantly evolves. And that's a like, rule from the Madonna handbook. Never have two album campaigns be in any way similar. Um, so I think the whole coming out you know, with the fruit theme in the beginning was where she was at at the time. And then it sort of morphed into like more sugary candies. and. You know, maybe next time we'll see her in a dominatrix outfit. Like, I don't know what to expect from Katie. And I think that that's the beauty of her. People weren't able to pigeonhole her necessarily as one thing. And I think if you can avoid being pigeonholed as one thing, you'll probably have a pretty long career because you can keep on evolving and being this protein figure. I think Katy Perry very early understood the whole like reinvention aspect of her career. So that's why she was, okay, fine. She's gonna be this like punk rock slanted kind of girl. And then she's gonna segue into being this pure pop star. And I'm sure at one point she's gonna just pick up an acoustic guitar and do an all acoustic tour. 
you know, I don't think anyone thought when Madonna was 25 that when she was 55, she would still be doing what she's doing. I'm sure everyone thought she was a flash in the pan. And I think Katy Perry is that kind of artist. I think she could be Madonna 2.0. But what is Katy Perry really like? Katy is a very lovely person to be around, very, very sweet. And I remember clearly, actually, my first meeting with her, which was backstage at one of her first shows in Britain when she had been performing at the Manchester Student Union. Now, it's quite interesting to think, think now because obviously she's moved into huge arenas, but even though she'd had the big success with I Kissed a Girl, she was starting quite slow in terms of her tour. She had me into her dressing room, she dressed me up in some bunny ears, she was dressed up as Snow White that night, and was incredibly open and honest right from the start. The other thing that's very important about her, which maybe most people don't get to see, but I certainly get to see, she's incredibly approachable. You can go and have a conversation with her and she won't shoo you away. She will actually look, at you, look you in the eye and connect and will genuinely answer whatever question you throw at her. You know, I like that. As a journalist, someone who has to interview people all the time, I'm not scared to ask her anything. And I think it's because she's very open. From the early days, Katie's fashion and style has raised eyebrows. She's very upfront about showing off her figure and has no problem about using her looks to help promote her music. She's renowned for her unconventional style, always bright and humorous and reminiscent of past decades. She has come into an era of pop music where she is battling Lady Gaga and Rihanna. So what has that meant? It's meant that they've all had to raise their game. So every outfit she thinks about. She hated it when Russell Brand posted on Twitter a photo that he had taken of Katie in bed wearing no makeup. It was very, very quickly deleted from his Twitter page. Obviously, by that point, it had already gone all around the internet. And I think that showed you how important looking good is for her. She loves looking girly. She loves like frilly dresses. She loves cotton candy, you know? Not everybody has to have such a hard image. I feel like she puts forth something a lot softer that girls from age eight to 80 can relate to basically, which makes her audience so huge. And that's a, just another, you know, smart move. I have always adored Katy Perry style because first of all, unlike some of these skinny women out there, she has curves and she's not afraid to show them off. And I, what I like though is that I think Katy Perry is very sexy, but I never have ever thought she dressed in a way that was vulgar. She basically likes to dress like a giant cartoon character or like a giant Barbie doll. And that's why little girls like her, but there's also a sexy edge to her where you know men can see her wearing her like little kind of 40s pin, pin up onesies or whatever and be like, yeah, that looks good. On the face of it, you know, she's just this girly, fun, cartoon character, kind of like an innocent Lady Gaga. So Lady Gaga goes for controversy. And Katy Perry is somebody that you wouldn't mind your kids watching, but you also like it too. So she, she goes across all age ranges. My favorite outfit of hers is her Hello Kitty Heatherette bustier. And that actually started a whole Hello Kitty thing with Katy Perry. You know, she has this alter ego, Kitty Purry, and uh, she always is rocking sort of like kind of cutesy, almost like, it's like a combination of like kind of Japanese cartoonishness with a little bit of 40s pinup. She has fun with fashion and she makes me want to dress up when I go to her shows. In 2010, Katie caused a real stir when she married controversial British actor, Russell Brand, star of Get Him to the Greek and Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Brand's bad boy reputation was legendary. His autobiography makes Keith Richards' autobiography look like nothing. The stu he was a sex addict, he was a drug addict, uh, he was certainly not the kind of, the marrying man type. You did not expect he would settle down, but you know, he met his match in Katie and they got engaged. A year later, they got married in India. You can imagine when two strong personalities go like that, it's not always gonna be perfect. But despite all her colorful eccentricity, Katie's background was pretty conservative. In fact, it was deeply religious. Katy Perry had the sort of upbringing that you would never actually believe for someone who's become such a raunchy pop star. 
She grew up in Santa Barbara, which was a very, very wealthy, well-to-do American suburb in California. And her parents were incredibly religious. Both of them were pastors. So Katie was limited in terms of what she was allowed access to. She had a very strict upbringing. I mean, she, she said in one interview she wasn't even allowed to eat deviled eggs because apparently deviled eggs are satanic. So you can only imagine when you think of that kind of upbringing to where she is now, like what a you know 180 she did. She was raised Catherine Elizabeth Hudson in a strict church-going household. Her parents, Keith and Mary, were evangelists, and the young Katie was baptized a born-again Christian and incorporated into their ministry, along with her brother and sister, David and Angela. Her evangelical mother, Mary Hudson, who is Portuguese descent, grew up in California and had a tempestuous first marriage in Zimbabwe. Her father, Keith, was a West Coast hipster in the 1960s. Katie's parents, Mary and Keith, are devout Christians, um, but that's not always the way it was. Keith is a bit like Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones, actually. He was a good time boy. Even now, there's remnants of his 60 days. He has the leather trousers, and he's well known in the neighborhood for wearing diamond crosses. He was wild. And actually, you could draw similarities to Russell Brand, who Katie eventually went on to fall in love with. Her household was completely religious. She wasn't allowed to watch TV. She wasn't allowed to read any book besides the Bible. She was not allowed to listen to any secular music growing up, which is kind of crazy. She was only allowed to listen to religious music. What she felt was that she was very, very limited in terms of her access to the outside world, really. She wanted to know about pop music. She wanted to know about Madonna. And that was something that her parents really limited. She would go to her friends' houses and kind of realize that they had access to all these things. So I think on some kind of level, like her attitude now, her kind of, you know, almost like bad girl, but kind of good girl attitude is always modeled on this sort of duality where she was like this girl who was rebellious by nature, but at the same time was this good girl that, you know, was the child of two pastors. She really wasn't allowed to do what normal kids were allowed to do, you know, go out to the mall, hang out until, you know, all hours of the night. I mean, they kept her at home. And she still goes back to it, you know, she has a Jesus tattoo and that's sort of a reminder of where she comes from. But she's named after a very well-known pastor, Catherine Coleman, you know, so religion is so deep in her sort of entire being, you know, in the makeup of Katy Perry, religion is a part of it. But despite the best efforts of her parents, Katie did manage to get her hands on some pop music, and it was a discovery that would change her destiny forever. The urban legend is she was at a slumber party where she was exposed to the music of Queen, and once she was exposed to Freddie Mercury, her life changed, as, as you can understand, Freddie Mercury's an icon to her still. And then um, apparently she smuggled in a Nirvana album into her house, and it was uh, stuff like that that got the ball rolling. Katie's influences were kind of a wide variety, mostly female pop stars like Joan Jett, Pat Benatar, Alanis Morissette. One of her biggest influences was Freddie Mercury of Queen. And you can see a little bit of, of Queen in Katy Perry, in the bold theatrics, the flamboyance. She was really into music, you know, she was really into pop culture, the little that she could see, um, because they really did limit her exposure to what she calls secular music. Katie was very much a child of the mid-1990s. That's where her musical influences really came from. So obviously that's when Madonna was having a very big renaissance around the time of Evita. It's when Cyndi Lauper was obviously iconic. But I think the one artist who really influenced Katie was Alanis Morissette, because the first album that she took to her heart was Jagged Little Pill. And of course, that was an album that was about female empowerment. It was about relationships. It was very honest and I think it had such a big impact on Katie's life that that even though musically now she's maybe not in the same genre as what Alanis was in terms of her lyrical content very very similar growing up as a little girl Katie was constantly vying for her parents attention over her sister Angela who was a major influence on her 
Katy Perry's first idol was in fact her sister, who was a little bit older than her. Now her sister would sing along to cassette tapes and when her sister left the house, Katy would crawl into her bedroom, she'd get the cassettes and she'd practice until she was absolutely perfect. Then she eventually got the courage to say to her mum and dad, listen, look what I can do. And her mum and dad sat back and said, wow, you can actually sing, let's get you some lessons as long as you're singing the gospel. Her parents, Keith and Mary, always recognised the young Katie's talent and they helped her to enrol in the Music Academy of Santa Barbara. It was around this time that Katie's horizons started to open up and it marked the beginning of her rebellion against her strict evangelical upbringing. Early on she went to, you know, summer camps and I think that was one of the early awakenings for her when she realised that she might have to kind of stray away from her strict religious background. You know, she was attracted to guys at an early age and she would then um, realized that, you know, maybe she was attracted to this guy and maybe, like, she wouldn't necessarily go to hell if, you know, she had sex. I mean, she, but she was going to really crazy religious, like, camps, you know, she went to a surf camp one year and, you know, it was kids praying that they would have big waves that year. So it kind of gives you an idea of what sort of environment she's growing up in. Well, she was, like, telling me about how, you know, her mom discovered a thong in her, you know, drawer and she got in trouble for it. And the girl that she had a crush on, actually, who was part of the inspiration for I Kissed a Girl was was a classmate who had a lot more freedom, a lot more personal freedom. Katie went to a very well-known and prestigious school in Montecito, which is a gorgeous and, and very rich town. She studied gospel, but also classical opera, um, an Italian style particularly. And famous um, alumni include Burt Bacharach, so she was in good company, but still, no one had any idea she would soon be a bikini-clad sexy pop star. It was gospel, which for a long time was the musical direction that Katie thought she would follow and that she thought would make her successful. It's quite crazy to think of that now when we look at some of the outfits that Katie wears and we look at the themes in her music, but for a long time, she very much was going to follow in the footsteps of her parents. Katie also took swing dancing classes as a teenager, which is where she got what she refers to as my 1940s style education and her flamboyant vintage image. Katie was, as a young girl, she was always interested in different things. Dance was actually one of her first passions. But, you know, even in the sense, like, one of the things that I think has, is a result of her popularity is that she has this kind of old kind of spirit. Like, she'll dress up as Betty Page or Betty Boop, and these are the kind of influences in addition to dressing up in, like, a giant fruit outfit. But she was into, like, doing dances like the Lindy Hop or the Jitterbug or, like, swing dancing. So there's this kind of old soul thing in her. Lolita is kind of like my style icon, very like innocent, but tiger inside, you know, we know what we're doing, but we come off very <laughs> innocent. In what now seems like an incredible twist of fate, Katie's blind ambition to make it as a music star was spotted by some Christian musicians from Nashville, who amazingly just happened to be in her parents' congregation one morning. At the time, Katie was still only 15. They brought her to Tennessee and helped guide her career path as a performer. In Nashville, Katie started recording demos and was taught by country music veterans on how to play guitar and craft songs. It was an experience that was to hold her in good stead for the future. She looked very different, obviously, sounded very different, but if you look at some of the YouTube footage out there, there's a lot floating out there, there's still that kind of like little bit of snarkiness and sass to her. You see how she interacts with the audience, the way she jokes with the audience. It seemed like there was that rebellious Katy Perry just dying to come out of Katie Hudson. At only 15, Katie signed to the Christian music label Red Hill and made her first album in 2001. I actually met her when she was Katie Hudson. It was like, you know, 2001 and she was shopping around this sort of gospel-y rock record, which I always thought was just a really strange combination. Um, but I was working at a magazine and, and uh, they brought her up and she was incredibly likable, you know? And I met all kinds of teen stars, but Katy Perry weirdly stood out. And I think it's because she really connected. She knows how to like look somebody in the eye and have a real conversation. And I could tell that she was wiser than her years, even though she was really, really young. The album didn't make a huge splash, unfortunately, because um, the label folded the same year the album came out, but perhaps for Katy Perry's sake, it was kind of 
better that way, that she could sort of erase Katie Hudson and embark on a clean slate because once that footage of Katie Hudson singing gospel did come out, a lot of people thought Katy Perry was manufactured, look, oh, she used to be singing about God, now she's singing about peacocks, whatever. Um, I think the Katy Perry we see now is the real Katy Perry. She pinpoints the moment actually when she did realise that she wanted to break away somewhat was when she went to a camp and she thought there was a hot guy there who she possibly wanted to have some form of relationship with and she thought actually why do I have to stay a virgin until I'm married and I think it was at that moment that she did really realize that there was going to be a conflict between her parents views the church's views and where Katie wanted to take her life although she has also made it very very clear that she's unapologetic about where she's where she's come from and she actually feels uncomfortable with the way that religion is presented in some modern pop culture for example, she criticised Lady Gaga for uh, putting the rosary beads in her mouth during one of Lady Gaga's music videos. So Katie is definitely religious, but not in a traditional way. Following the flop of her gospel album, Katie realised that if she was serious about becoming a pop star, she needed to radically change her image. Performing as Katie Hudson was a problem. The name was too similar to the Hollywood actress Kate Hudson. So she took the decision to change her surname to Perry, her mother's maiden name. The Katie Hudson name thing was something that weighed over her like a gray cloud, you know? And it was so obvious that every sort of journalist that she met at the time, a radio person, would bring that up. And I think it like stifled her. As soon as she changed her name, it was like the real Katy Perry was born. But it was already there, that likability, the charm, the charisma, the fact that she could actually sing because she actually sang. Um, you know, you could tell that this was a very talented person that was going somewhere, even back in 2001. Ever ambitious, Katie moved to Los Angeles to be closer to music's inner sanctum. And never one to let the grass grow under her feet, she landed a recording contract with producer Glenn Ballard and Island Records. So at 17 years old, Katie gets a deal with Island Def Jam. So they asked her, what kind of producers do you want to work with? And she didn't know that much about music that wasn't religious music. So she one day is like at home and she sees a special on a Lost Morissette. And Glenn Ballard was the man who had worked on Jagged Little Pill. She saw him on TV and was like, that's who I want to work with. She thought, I'm going to get this man. And she did. What teenager has that ambition and tenacity? The two of them worked together for years. This music never came out though. He sort of coached her and groomed her, much as he did with Alanis actually, and um, he, she can probably owe a lot to him. But those songs never came out other than one song on the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants soundtrack. You can find it and it's a very different Katie, much more of a kind of rockist Katie, kind of an Alanis-esque Katie. But despite Glenn Ballard's guiding hand and all Katie's hard work, Sadly, Def Jam dropped her. But undeterred, Katie continued her quest for fame and fortune, and by 2004, she signed with Columbia Records. Already, it was her third record label, and she was still only 20 years old. But Columbia wouldn't prove an easy ride for Katie either. One of the label's ideas was to pair her with record producers, The Matrix. Now, when she got paired up with The Matrix, they were like the hottest production team like in pop music, but they were kind of on their way out. And I think that they thought, pair this hot commodity with a new up and coming singer and it'll be like the perfect formula of like perfect pop songs, perfect looking pop singer. It didn't quite happen. Her album was due to come out in 2005 and then once again, she found herself without a record label. And I can imagine at that time, she probably was starting to get worried. She was like, I've been through three labels already. I've been dropped, labels have folded. What am I gonna do next? But you know, the next, uh, the next big thing for her was really right around the corner. Although the album never really saw the light of day, Katie had successfully captured the attention of the music press. The record didn't do anything, but the one thing it did do is it made her a known quantity to journalists. I think the press liked that album. We listened to it. And even though it didn't come out, you know, it was good. And I think a big reason why it was good is because Katy Perry was singing on it. And that talent was recognizable right from the front. But yeah, you know, Columbia sat on it. 
They didn't do anything with her. They didn't do anything with, you know, the Matrix, Katy Perry combination. And eventually she was dropped. And it's just like, you know, there's nothing atypical about that story. It happens all the time. What's really difficult is when you get thrown off the horse, jumping back up and finding another record deal, not giving up, having that sort of motivation that will carry you through. And she did. She never gave up. She was always convinced that she would become a superstar. She would become a pop star. This was her path. And there are very, very few artists who reach the age of, say, 24, have been dropped three times and still managed to go on to become a global superstar. It says a lot for how tenacious she was. I think when you, you only evolve necessarily when you kind of fail, and she had failed three different times now at a really young age. And I think it had, it had not only strengthened her resolve, it had allowed her to kind of see the business, see what worked. The disappointment of being dropped by so many record labels would have floored most 20-year-olds at the time, but Katie was made of sterner stuff. I think she really struggled. She struggled financially more than anything. You know, she couldn't pay her rent. She was like, about to move back in with her parents, basically. So it was an extremely low point for her, not just in her career, but personally. You know, when you're beat down like that and, and you're writing songs and you're trying to put your music out there and you're, you're getting a lot of negative feedback, I mean, that can be really demoralizing. So I, I think that she really struggled with it. At one point, Katie said, and this was after being dumped by her third record label, she was sitting in her car, a car which she was two months behind on in repayment. She had no money to pay the rent. She thought, is this it? And something gave her the strength to think, no, I'm not going to be beaten. I'm going to go on. And just as well, she did. You know, the key to the music industry, if you start young enough, is to be persistent and to keep at it, you know, and if it's meant to be, it's meant to be, and, and it clearly was. But then fate stepped in once again to help her rise above the pain of rejection. And this time, it came in the form of Virgin Records chairman Jason Flom, then head of Capital Music Group. They met, he considered it, and then it was six months of silence. But I think he realized after six months of thinking about it that they had a real star on their hands. And, and he called her out of the blue one day and basically said just that, like, you know, we want you. When Katie was signed by Capital, one of the key decisions that they made is that she needed to have a big, big pop record. That was the only way that this girl was going to be able to break through. I am a singer and I just wrapped my record and it's going to be released in the late spring or early summer 07. So they put her in touch with Dr Luke, who is now one of the world's biggest pop producers and at that time was a real up-and-comer. Dr. Luke, for people who don't know, it, he basically has his finger on the pulse of the pop world, particularly of the female listeners out there. He, some of the songs he's had a hand in are Kesha's TikTok, Miley Cyrus's Party in the USA, Since You've Been Gone and My Life Will Suck Without You by Kelly Clarkson. And, I mean, the list goes on. It's kind of crazy when you see his credits. Collaborating with Dr. Luke was to prove her springboard to international success. Katie's debut single was You're So Gay. The EP issued by Capital created a huge online buzz, bringing Katie to the attention of Madonna, who went on record saying she was a fan. It sent Katie's name soaring around the world at the time and helped catapult her onto the international stage. It felt like it hit a critical mass when Perez Hilton put it on his website and Madonna reacted to it. Those two things, like, together, I think just made that song explode. The majority of people in America probably thought that Katy Perry's career started with I Kissed a Girl, which was her first huge hit, but she actually had a single out before that that I loved, and this was my introduction to Katy Perry. It was a song called You're So Gay, actually spelled in sort of Twitter speak. You're So Gay was very much a sort of like funny version of You Oughta Know. It was a vitriolic, hateful breakup song. I mean, the first line in it is, I hope you hang yourself with your H&M scarf, which I think is like one of the best lines ever. I hope you hang yourself with your H&M scarf while jacking off listening to Mozart. You bitchin' moon about LA wishing you were in the rain reading Hemingway. You're So Gay was very interesting. It's an interesting start for her. At the time, it didn't seem like Capital wanted to turn her into the huge kind of like 
fluffy pop star she is now. She definitely seemed to still be holding on to more of her rock roots that you see in the stuff she did in the that never came out in the 2000s, the sort of Alanis inspired stuff. You're so sad, maybe you should buy a happy meal. You're so skinny, you should really supersize the deals. Even though it wasn't like a huge hit, it got her name out there. And it got the fact that she was sort of like a fearless female out there just by putting a song like that out. And the endorsement from Madonna is key. You know, if you're going to be, um, you know, a visually minded artist who's a pop singer and, you know, the kind of person who can put on a spectacle of a show, you want to follow in the Madonna, you know, path. And Madonna giving her okay, giving her a blessing was, you know, a huge endorsement for Perry that she could ride that. And she did. You know, when you get that cosign, it's like the big, I mean, it's the biggest cosign you can possibly have for a female singer. You know, Madonna says it's good. I was like, Madonna? Madonna, are you? This is a joke. No, she's amazing and she is, you know, someone I aspire to be like. Um, because, you know, in the midst of like all kinds of people unraveling and in, in the pop world and in the female pop world especially, that woman has stayed so consistent. And even like Gwen Stefani, I, I think they're, you know, somewhat in the same realm. They're just consistent and ever-changing and appreciate their fans and play to their fans and they want to entertain people. So they keep their private lives private and like they're all business and they can bring it every time. And then came the single that sent Katy Perry into the music stratosphere, I Kissed a Girl. It was a concept that Katy had had in her head for about 18 months, but actually she only recorded it right near the end of her sessions with Dr. Luke. Now it's incredible to think that if she hadn't have thought, actually let's just record this little thing I have in my head, probably none of her success would have come about because while her album, her first album, One of the Boys, was full of hit singles. It was I Kissed a Girl that turned her into a force to be reckoned with in the pop industry. The lyrics are simple but catchy. I kissed a girl and I liked it. The taste of her cherry chapstick. That conjures up a taste, an image. It's not too racy. And actually, you know, teenagers can listen to it, young girls can listen to it. And it's not very sexual, but it's naughty. No, I don't even know your name. She said in interviews that it was inspired by Scarlett Johansson. She's also said in interviews that it was inspired by a girl that she'd known at 15 years old. It doesn't really matter who inspired it. Katy Perry knew that if you're a girl and you talk about kissing other girls, but you're not really gay because you have a boyfriend and he's liking it, there's not like really gonna be a huge scandal about it. There's gonna be enough, it's gonna interest people but not create like a huge scandal. But it kind of made Katy Perry this like whole target of jokes. But I think Katy Perry knew that it was going to be that. I mean, it's smart. Like if people are talking about you, in, especially in a world where we're like, there's a million YouTube channels, there's a million regular cable channels, there's all these distractions in the world, you know, if people are talking about you, eventually she, I think, realized that there's gonna be drunk sorority girls that are gonna buy that single on iTunes pretty quickly. And uh, yeah, 4.1 million of them did. I Kissed a Girl earned Perry a nomination for Best Female Vocal Performance at the 2009 Grammy Awards. It also spawned a significant controversy. It certainly raised eyebrows. It certainly um, caught people's attention. Some people thought it was homophobic, other pe or other people thought it was too pro-gay. It was definitely polarizing, but sometimes being polarizing is what works, you know? It's like not playing it safe. It was expected to be more controversial than it was. The record company was very concerned that a lot of the country stations in along the Bible Belt in America would not touch it. But actually, because Katie portrayed the song in such an inoffensive way, and it was a bit of fun rather than being something that was really sexually explicit, it just connected. And it was one of the biggest songs of that year. 
it was the pop song that, that defined her. The song topped the Billboard charts for seven straight weeks and it topped the charts in seven countries. It sold 4.1 million copies and it's actually ranked at the moment the 10th uh, largest selling digital single of the 21st century. So Katy Perry all of a sudden, you know, isn't just some random pop star that Capitol's trying to break. She's the I Kissed a Girl Girl. The tension between her controversial lyrics and her religious background also appeared to affect her family. Around the time that Katy Perry first started to get big, obviously she had songs like I Kissed a Girl, You're So Gay, songs about getting drunk in Vegas. Uh, it was reported that her parents were not happy about this and that her mother had actually said in an interview that it was disgusting. She found her uh, daughter's music disgusting, but her, her mother did later deny this, say she, that was not true. Her mum was not happy with the fact that Katie's first song, the very, very iconic now, I Kissed a Girl, obviously had homosexual themes. You can imagine if you grew up in a home where you couldn't even eat deviled eggs. You know, your par and your parents are pastors. They might have a little problem with you singing about, you know, I want to see your peacock and things like that. Uh, but you know what? It's, Katie just does what she wants. I mean, uh, she's kind of the classic rebel girl, right? The sort of idea that, it, you know, a girl who's very sheltered when she gets a, a little taste of the outside world just goes nuts, marries Russell Brand, you know, shoots with cream out of her bra. But I, I you know, I think that what makes her kind of relatable, that she's got this kind of rebellious, like rebellious edge to her, but she still seems like a girl next door. Actually, her mom behind the scenes, as Katie said, was there at just about every one of her gigs. There was an awful lot of pride there. Worry, worry her daughter was going off the rails and no longer doing gospel, that's for sure, but pride too. The album, One for the Boys, went platinum and Katie went on the warped tour to promote it. At the time, she was definitely being marketed as sort of a rocker chick next door, a pop rock chick. And if you see the footage from those days, she's rocking it up, she's spraying beer, she's wearing, you know, Converse sneakers and jumping up and down. It's very hard to imagine her doing now, now that she comes out dressed like a mermaid or an alien or a giant Hello Kitty. It was a very strategic and a smart move in retrospect by Capitol Records to put her on the Warp Tour. I think that it was a, about cool cred more than anything because you could easily look at somebody who, you know, runs around dressed as fruit and think that's really corny. But the fact that she came out on the Warp Tour, the fact that she stage dived, that she could like, you know, go toe to toe with these like sort of big, greasy, tattooed dudes, I think did a lot for her credibility. She was just a badass chick who you could rock out with at the Warp Tour together. And it's very interesting to me that that's how she started. And somewhere along the line, I would say maybe right around the time of uh, Hot and Cold, and certainly by the time Teenage Dream came out, she, the rock pretensions were gone. She was just number one pop star in the world. The guitar was gone. The rock band behind her, punk dudes, was gone. And no more Warp Tour. She was pop all the way. I'm doing some dance now because the music has changed from like a little bit more of the rock to a lot more of the pop and um, I don't want to look like my mother on stage, although I feel like my mother when I'm rehearsing. So yeah, I'm just trying to get my swagger back like Justin Bieber. Around this time, Katie had a brief feud with British singer-songwriter Lily Allen. It was a high-profile argument that hit the headlines and helped her image appear more controversial than ever. No rising pop star is complete without a little spat, and Katy Perry didn't disappoint. During an interview, she said, I'm kind of like the slimmer version, the skinny version of Lily Allen. Katie said later that it didn't come out the way she intended, and, and I, I believe her there. Lily Allen threw all her toys out the pram and said, well, I hear that you're the real answer to me. Lily made it clear that she had been told that Katie's record label in America had only signed her Katie because they wanted an American version of Lily Allen. They wanted someone who was a bit kooky and a little bit weird in terms of where their musical style was going while being pop. Her second album, Teenage Dream, came out in 2010 and crystallised her role as one of her generation's most original pop stars. That album, she decided that she wants to make like a poppy summer album and she definitely makes that turn like towards more poppy fairy. She's working with Dr. Luke again and actually gives him a mixtape of songs by Abba and the Cardigans. So you can kind of get the idea. She's like wanting like frothy, like summertime, kind of these like effervescent kind of pop ballads. When Teenage Dream was being recorded and it was sort of like getting towards the final phase, 
she um, she and I did an interview, and she was so excited about it that she wanted to play these songs, even though they weren't finished. So we sat in her car for, you know, probably at least an hour and listened to a good half of the record. And and I remember hearing songs like Firework and thinking, well, that's going to be a hit, you know, and Peacock, like, oh, that's that's a good song. You know, it was just, I was so impressed even at that sort of not complete phase. I'm so excited! Um, more excited about my album than Bieber Fever, but kind of at war with the feelings. Um, it's so exciting. It's coming out this summer. It's a summer record. It's uh, what I said I wanted earlier. I finally got, we nailed it. It's roller skating. It's 90s. It's Ace of Base. It's Cindy Lauper. It's like all these colors and more. The first single from the album was California Girls. I know a place where the grass is really greener. Katie had obviously used I Kissed a Girl to launch one of the boys, and it was massive as a result. So there was a lot of pressure on her to come up with a song that was going to be as catchy, as quirky, and as fun. The song that the record company believed would really catapult Katie yet again to the top of the pop charts was California Girls. It was released around summer and it did become the summer anthem. It was a huge hit single. Snoop Dogg featured, it was incredibly catchy, everyone could sing along. I very distinctly remember the first time I heard California Girls because I was so distinctly surprised by how different the song sounded. It was actually at um, a birthday party for Perez Hilton and Katy Perry was there making a grand entrance and being the star of show as usual. She entered wearing a circus outfit on top of an elephant. Just a typical day in Katy Perry's life. So Katy Perry decided to debut her song. She gave it to the DJ and this was months before it came out. And I remember listening to this and going, this doesn't sound like her. Like it's so pure pop, there's not even like a slight hint of a guitar or any of the kind of like rock indie things she might have had going on before. When I first heard California Girls, I thought it was brilliant because I couldn't tell initially what era it was from. It kind of sounds 80s and it kind of even sounds 70s, but it sounds so current at the same time. Like. I thought it was just genius musically. But more than that, I could tell that there was like a pride there. You know, she's from California. She grew up in Santa Barbara. She's very much that beach girl. And I just thought it was like really smart. Everything about it was smart from the uh, guests to the musical, uh, you know, to actually the way it was built musically to the video. It was all sort of like weirdly genius. And what a great, mark to make on your new record, you know, to come out with that song. It's like the Glee formula. The seven-year-old won't pick up on it. The 17-year-old will pick up on it a little bit. The 22-year-old will totally understand it. And, you know, obviously anything above that, you know, they totally get where the innuendo is coming from. But it's just another great way to spread it out, you know? Like the rest of the album, California Girls found Katie enlisting outside collaborators. Once again, it proved how keen she is to work on the edge of her comfort zone. There might be some really cool guest appearances by some cool rappers from the West Coast. Thinking, all right, I, have, I want the California anthem, but if I write the song called California Girls, it's going to be ridiculous because I'm like this pop star, like who's going to take me seriously. So what do I need to do? I'm going to get Snoop Dogg. So she gets Snoop Dogg. And you can't dislike Snoop. So again, it's a really like smart manipulated move. California Girls, Big Star, Tupac, Snoop Dogg, bra shooting whipped cream. It's going to be a hit. Amazingly, California Girls was the fastest rising album from a Capitol Records artist since Bobby Gentry's Ode to Billy Joe in 1967. 
The other thing the teenage dream does is establish her, her as more than just like a pop commodity, establishes her as kind of a serious artist in her own right. I actually think Katy is quite underrated as a songwriter. I think lyrically some of her songs are really, really powerful actually, especially her ballads. And also, she has always said, you know, if you want to find out what I really think, if you want to hear about my relationships, if you want to hear about my past, listen to my albums. You're not a man, you're just a man If you listen to the lyrics um, in my favorite song by her, which is Mannequin, of her first album, self pen song, it's like, it's a heartbreaking song. It's a song about, you know, wanting to get to know someone, but they're not real. They're just a mannequin to you. They're not a, a real boy. The critics loved Teenage Dream, and it went on to garner five Grammy nominations. You know, I think it's nice to be nominated. Last year I was nominated in the same category as well, which is quite interesting. And I was just beginning at that moment. That was like the first spring that everything happened. So um, I didn't expect that at all. Not that I expected this or expect any other acknowledgement, but I think I'm just um, happy to be recognized by the industry and by you know the group of people that I've been working with for a long time. I made the record for like five years and was on multiple different labels and started in Nashville and I know like a lot of the vote voting pop majority is in Nashville actually. Not a lot, Fingers but crossing. yeah, <laughs> right? Remember me? No, but um, I think that I've, I have a lot of friends out there and it's nice that they would even acknowledge the hard work. Firework was Katie's third and most popular single from the album. Do you ever feel like a plastic bag? She shot the video for Firework in Budapest in October 2010. And an open casting call drew 38,000 participants. It was just one of those zeitgeisty songs. She's all about very, very accessible concepts, very catchy sing-along choruses. And that's how she's managed to have hit single after hit single after hit single. Incredibly successful when it comes to her run of domination on the pop charts over the last four years. Teenage Dream went platinum five times. And just a couple of years ago, Katy Perry had been sitting in her car wondering how she was going to pay for it. It's incredible. It's rags to riches. It's the American dream. In 2010, Katie followed an established music tradition by appearing on the American children's show Sesame Street. Hi, Elmo. But as usual, she was never far from the headlines. She was on doing a preschool version of Hot and Cold with Elmo, and it was adorable. It was adorable. And to promote their next season, they were putting up the clips on YouTube on their official channel before they were on the air. And um, you probably have noticed that Katy Perry is not a flat-chested girl. This is not something she's ever tried to hide. She's very into showing off her body. I can't do it or my boobs will fall out and that would be like way yeah, more than this interview needs. <laughs> but unfortunately, the, the Sesame Street video with Elmo involved her running around a lot. So she was, yeah. And parents start to complain and YouTube commenters start to make YouTube comments. And all of a sudden there's like this totally fabricated controversy over Katy Perry going on Sesame Street, performing hot and cold, corrupting the youth. That spooked out the people at Sesame Street and said, I don't think we're going to run this. She's the kind of girl who sort of developed early and wished through all those teenage years that her breasts weren't as big as they were. So to have that happen on Sesame Street, I felt like was such a slap in the face to someone who struggled with this issue. So, you know, I didn't understand it, but I know she took it very well. I felt bad for her knowing that she's had these you know, body issue things. The video is still available online, but it never aired on Sesame Street. But in a way that just kind of maybe almost reestablished a little bit of her rock cred that she got banned from Sesame Street. I don't think any other musicians ever can claim that.
In her early days, Katie was romantically linked with Travi McCoy, singer with Gym Class Heroes. The relationship was tempestuous, and both artists recorded songs about their breakup. Katy Perry is always someone who's been pretty open about her relationship, and she was dating Travi McCoy of Gym Class Heroes. Basically, things went awry, and then he apparently said some things about her, and then she basically comes back with a song called Circle of the Drain. basically attacks his prescription pill habit, calls him a joke, makes fun of him for being indie rock and roll and really not, and just like basically savages him. I never see them in the same room together. Even when he had a hit going on with a billionaire, like, and they were at award shows, and you never saw them anywhere near each other. I feel like that is a very, very acrimonious relationship. Like, not quite Chris Brown, Rihanna level, but close. But it was her marriage to controversial British comedian, Russell Brand, that really hit the headlines. They originally met on the set of Get Him to the Greek. He had a lead role and she had a minor role, which was actually later cut. It never made it to the cinema screens. And he kissed her, actually, on the set of the movie. And they said, they both said the sparks just flew. She said that her heart stopped, and she thought, oh my God, he is actually the one. As Bran's status grew in Hollywood, he was asked to present the Video Music Awards, and their relationship catapulted them both into the limelight. I do know that when I watched the show, Russell Brand had a really kind of funny quip, and he said, Katy Perry didn't win any VMA awards tonight, but she's staying in my hotel, and I guess she'll need a shoulder to cry on. So I think you can kind of uh, infer where that went. And then, you know, next thing you know, like they're on taking world on trips, like Hawaii and um, Thailand and India, and they're riding elephants, and basically their life turns into kind of a scene from Zoolander. He was really cheeky to her. She's not used to this. Come on, it's Katy Perry. Guys are afraid to chat her up. All of a sudden, he's making fun of her on stage. She lobs a can of juice at him, and that got his attention. That night of the 2009 VMAs in New York City was like the happiest I had ever seen her. I actually remember being at a Lady Gaga after party for the VMAs, and it was like, you know, a huge table with Katie and all of her team and Russell and all of his team and Gaga, who has a huge team. So there were like literally 30 people, but it was like Russell and Katie just like talking in their own zone, in their own world. And I kind of like got the sense that something was happening there. You know, it was like, it was really cool to actually see it. Brand's reputation as a womanizer had gone before him. Russell was a Lothario before he met Katie, and that's probably a nice way of putting it. Some people would say he was a serial love cheat, and he actually was a self-confessed sex addict who said that at some times he slept with up to 80 women a month. So he's gone from having that sort of background to becoming completely faithful to Katie. When people say Russell Brand's a player, oh my God, they're not joking. I met him quite a few times when I was a showbiz reporter. He was charismatic. He'd cut out the booze and the drugs. His new addiction was women. A producer friend of mine who worked with him on radio shows said he would come out of his weekly slot. There would be 20, 30, 40 girls just waiting for him, not just to get the autograph. He would go that one, that one, that one, yeah, that one, and take them back to his hotel room. Katie and Russell married on October 23rd, 2010, in a traditional Hindu ceremony near the Ranthambhor Tiger Sanctuary in Rajasthan, India, the same location where Russell proposed to Katie. The marriage in India between Katy Perry and Russell Brand was really interesting. They decided to go back to the place in India where Russell had proposed to Katy. Now, I always got the sense this was 
how Russell imagined getting married. I mean, it's very him, isn't it? You know, they were in traditional Indian garb, they were traditional Indian folk musicians, there were elephants as part of the ceremony, they got married within a tiger resort. But I think that excites Katie because I think there's a big part of her that would have expected to have a very traditional American white wedding. And the fact that she's got someone like Russell who pulls her completely out of her comfort zone is something that really seems to excite her. Their wedding made headlines across the world, and not surprisingly, the day itself proved to be an unusual and highly decorative affair. Their marriage in India was spectacular, but it was a very spiritual ceremony that meant a lot to Russell because he believes in Hinduism and loves um, the ethics and the country that is India. But also an old um, member of their church from America was brought over to conduct the service. So Katie's family had a bit of a role to play and it wasn't as if Christianity was out the window, it was very much there on the day. Katie has been very vocal about her religious beliefs and she's also been outspoken about the mixing of religion and sex, even wrapping Russell Brown's knuckles along the way for blasphemy. Usually in a couple, there's a quiet one, and then there's a more flamboyant one that's sort of a yin and yang, but there's two yins with that couple. They're both crazy outside personalities. They're two alpha people, alpha male, alpha female. <laughs> two cartoons come to life almost. It's also interesting to wonder what Katie's pastor parents think of Katie's choice in husband because uh, Russell Brand has a very storied past. I actually think their personalities are very different. Russell is the archetypal grit, Katie is the archetypal Californian girl. She's made it very, very clear that she has no intention to move to Britain on a permanent basis because she loves the weather, she loves the lifestyle of Los Angeles. And sadly, those cultural differences were shockingly highlighted only 14 months after the wedding. In December 2011, it was Russell who filed for divorce from Katie citing irreconcilable differences. Now clean and sober, it was alleged he was sick of Katie's constant partying. Reports that Katie didn't want kids just yet is also said to have added fuel to the fire. Other rumours suggest that Russell wasn't overly keen on Katie's close friend, Rihanna. Although she's never spoken publicly about the breakup, Katie's always been crystal clear about what she thinks is important in a relationship. You know what? I think for me, it's nothing about the big things. I think for me, it's all about the little things. And I think for women especially, it's all about the details. You don't have to like go off and get married to prove your love. You don't have to you know, do big things that cost lots of money. All you have to do is call us back. And not send us a text, but tell us on you know the phone or in person, oh, you look beautiful, or I love you, or just tiny little things, like flowers when it's not your birthday, or flowers when it's not a, you know, a, a breakup, you know, or a makeup, or whatever. Little things make up a huge picture, and they're consistent, and they can keep you there for a long time. I think over the last few years though, Katie has felt that now she has to hold back more about her personal life. I remember interviewing her quite recently. It was her first interview in the UK since she had married Russell Brand, who is obviously a very big figure in the UK. And while she was prepared to talk about it to some degree, I think she now feels much more protective about holding something back when it comes to her personal relationship. It's obvious to all who know her that Katie has huge acting ambitions and that a career in the movies is certainly on her radar. Katie recently voiced the part of Smurfette in the blockbuster movie The Smurfs. Now this is really astute because she probably can't be wearing the bright blue and pink wigs until her 40s and 50s. She's tenacious, she's ambitious, she's thinking of the next thing. And why not? The likes of Justin Timberlake went very successfully from being a pop star to a movie star. It's got longevity and it's got Katy Perry's name all over it. So why has her music been so successful? I went to see her concert at the Nokia Theatre, and there were a lot of seven and eight and nine-year-old girls. 
but there were also a lot of couples and there were also a lot of like, you know, over 40s. And it just felt like the audience was so diverse, you know, like, like she can speak to any age. I think the third album is going to be a really testing time for Katy Perry because what it's going to say is does she have the opportunity to become a pop star with longevity along the lines of Madonna who has endorsed Katy of course and Madonna was one of Katy's real idols but likewise could she just be a phenomenon that lasts two albums, I Kissed a Girl, California Girls, and Quickly Forgotten. I think she needs to move on musically. I think I think she needs to mature what she's doing a little bit and reinvent herself, which was obviously why Madonna managed to stay so successful. So I think the next two years will, you know, will t really tell whether she's going to be a force for music for the next 20 years. She understands the music business. You know, a lot of people get into the music business because they have very big dreams and they want to see their names and lights, but they don't think beyond that. And I think Katy Perry thinks more about that than seeing her name in lights. She has the rare ability to kind of see a situation and kind of see all the moving parts and figure out which kind of path she needs to go. And almost in a way, she's navigated the gauntlet of the recording industry for the last 10 years. I think she's really figured out what works when it comes to marketing a pop star to a huge audience. And, you know, there's a, weirdly, there's a science to it. And I think she's kind of figured it out. So yeah, as long as she keeps following the formula that, that she's had, that has taken her this far, I think we're gonna be seeing a lot more of her in the future. I think Katy Perry has longevity because she's so darned ambitious and clever. She doesn't have longevity in what she's doing right now. I don't want to see her when she's 40 in a bikini and polka dots and funny wigs, but she's going to be a success um, in the movies, absolutely. And ultimately, I hope that her music develops to have more depth. She could run a record company one day. I actually think I told her that. Like, you know, she has the sort of knowledge and that um, that insider view that is so hard to come by. Like, she could be like a Jay-Z. I think it was obvious from the beginning that Katy Perry's plan was for world domination. She's obviously already branched into acting. She did the Smurfette voice. She actually had a scene in Get Him to the Greek. She's got a perfume out now. She, you know, is sung with other people. I could see her writing for other people. She's the classic example of someone who is a brand. 